Please be seated. And the choir, if you'd like to come down here for a moment. Trinity Sunday. So today is Trinity Sunday. It's, a, it's an odd Sunday in the church's liturgical year because most of the liturgical year, if you ever pay attention to it, <laughs> they're laughing, which I don't know is a good thing <laughs> if they're actually paying attention to what we're doing on Sundays. But the liturgical year, the way it's structured is it follows the life of Jesus Christ. And so generally all the feasts of the liturgical year focus on the various chapters within the Gospels. And so we essentially follow the journey from Christ's nativity to the great feast, Christ's resurrection and ascension, and then of course Pentecost, which we celebrated last Sunday. But there are a couple of feasts in the church's year which we actually observe what we call a doctrine, essentially a teaching of the church. Now to some of us this may seem really strange. Why would we observe a doctrine rather than an event or a moment in the life of Jesus Christ? It's also a Sunday, writes Stephen, where most of us priests are terrified to preach on. In fact, I kid you not, most parishes, the rector of the parish will often sign to the curate, the one who was just ordained, and said, you can preach Trinity Sunday, which curates all sit in angst, thinking, how am I going to do this? How do I explain the Trinity? I mean, none of us are like St. Patrick, where we can take a three-leaf clover and say, oh, the Trinity is like this. So priests get this anxious feeling on this day. I think we're missing the point. I really honestly think we're missing the point. For the first thing, you and I will never fully know or understand God. Let's make that fully clear here. You and I will never fully know or understand who God is. Because God is greater than anything, as St. Anselm said, greater than anything that can ever be imagined or conceived. So if anybody tells you they know what God is thinking, run for the door. Because that's where we get into trouble. In fact, we Christians ought to have a greater humility these days to know that when we approach before God, we do so cautiously. And in fact, our Jewish sisters and brothers, they get this better than we do. If you ever pay attention to the Old Testament, you read the story of Moses, you'll note that Moses was terrified to go into the presence of God because he thought he would die. God was so great. The people who Moses was with, the Hebrew people, they were so scared of Moses because Moses saw God. They thought if they looked upon Moses, they would die. So they put a veil over his face so they could not behold his eyes after he saw the face of God. It's really quite profound. In Judaism also, you do not name God. Because to name God means you have authority over God. So a little preface here on this. Trinity is much more a lesson about who we are than it is about who God is. So you might all recall from your biblical lessons in the book of Genesis, we are told in the creation narratives that God created the first human persons in God's image and likeness. And that we are essentially called to live out God's command and to live as God lives, a loving way of life. And as you go through the scriptures, there's various scenes in which God reveals God's self to the people. And also in the book of Genesis, there's this marvelous, beautiful story. How many of you know Abraham and Sarah? Raise your hand. Who all knows Abraham? Okay, good. <laughs> Some people are listening. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah. So this is a little bit unusual sermon. So you're going to have to work today, okay? You can't sit comfortably today. Abraham and Sarah, we read in the Old Testament, in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Abraham and Sarah were called by God to lead God's chosen people to the promised land. In that exchange, God says to Abraham, look, Abraham, you are going to be a father of a great nation, a huge nation. 
But Abraham's got a problem. His wife is infertile, or he could have been too. But at that time, unfortunately, the blade, the sorry, ladies, they often blamed women rather than the men. So Abraham's really perplexed by this. He's really troubled. He's disturbed that God says you'll be a father of a great nation. But he's saying, I can't. And not only that, but he and Sarah are becoming old. She's well past the age of fertility. So one day, Abraham is sitting in his tent. And lo and behold, we are told in the scriptures that three figures come into their midst. We neither know if they were angels or who they were. The scriptures are quite vague on who these three figures are. But there's something divine about these figures. That much we do know. And Abraham, being the ever gracious guest, because in Judaism you always have a great feast, instantly tells the servants to go ahead and prepare a lavish banquet for his guests as they come to sit at meal. And the three figures sit down, they talk with Abraham, and they note that Sarah will have a child. Now Sarah, at the time she was known as Sarai, she is in the tent and she laughs out loud. And the angels say, why do you laugh? Which at that point, Sarah's terrified. How could they hear? How could they know? It's a story of life, new life, coming into the midst. Over the centuries, Christians turned to this scene and see it as a moment where God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come, comes and sits with God's beloved people. Oddly enough, we don't actually have very many scenes of this. And what I have before you, and some of you have it as your sheets, is probably one of the most famous icons within orthodoxy. Now, how many of you have seen an icon before? Don't be shy. Okay. Anglicans like icons, by the way, because we Anglicans have actually cultivated a very strong relationship with our orthodox Christian friends. And icons serve as a powerful tool for worship and meditation. Icons are not paintings. Icons are rather windows into the eternal. And that as persons, we're called to sit before an icon and to imagine ourselves in this moment, in this scene, in a sense that we are entering into the holy. This icon here was painted by a writer. And in fact, we don't call them painters. We actually call them writers because they write it by a man by the name of André Lup... Uh, oh my gosh, I just blanked it. Rublev, thank you. I just had a blank. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> Stayed up too late. Thank you, Anton. <laughs> André Lublev. It's held right now, I believe, in the St. Petersburg Museum there. And it's called Troitsa, or Trinity. It is a powerful scene in which we see this moment when the three persons, three angels, three figures, come with God, or with Abraham. And the scene is very telling and revealing, and points at something about you and I. So let me first explain the icon. So this isn't a real icon here. Icons, I have one in my office. Icons are first layered with some gold a very gold uh, paper, almost like. And then after many months of prayer, the writer slowly sketches out the image onto the icon. It takes a long time. In fact, while they are writing it, they are to fast. They are to fast completely as they're doing this. And what Rublev does is he pictures the three figures, and he gives us hints that they are the three persons of the Holy Trinity. On the very left, or on my left, you have a figure sort of in a rose and blue color. That figure, we believe, is the Father. 
the Father who is the Creator, Lord, and Creator of all things. And the reason why we know that is, first, His outer garment is sort of an earthy tone, so He's the Creator of creation, but then also He has a little bit of blue, symbolizing life and the eternal. In the center of the figure, we have Jesus. Now, traditionally in Christian iconography, Jesus is always portrayed in a deep, sort of reddish color with blue. And what that symbolizes is Jesus' humanity and divinity interwoven together as one. And you'll get another hint, you'll notice Jesus' hands seem to be pointing down. It tells us something else about Jesus, that Jesus is human and divine. Sometimes if you watch a priest bless, you'll notice sometimes I'll take my hand like this, I'll have two fingers up and three down. What it's symbolic of is the two natures of Christ and the three persons of the Holy Trinity. So even my gestures often express some of this. On the very right, or, yes, now I'm getting confused here. On the right, we have the Holy Spirit. Now in the, Christ, in the West, the Spirit is often portrayed by red, but in the Christian East, the Spirit is portrayed with green for life, new life. So in Pentecost, in the Orthodox Church, they wear green rather than red and blue because it was the Spirit who hovered over the waters of creation. Behind the Father, we see a house, and the house is symbolic of hospitality. It's also symbolic of that wonderful line in the Gospels in which Jesus says, in my Father's house there are many rooms for you. Behind Jesus, you have a single tree. Now in the story of Abraham, that tree was known as the oak of Mamre, the place where they were located. But here, Rublev uses a tree symbolic of something else. And anybody want to guess what other trees? Anybody know about another tree in the scriptures, also in Genesis? You want to take a guess? Tree of life. So in the garden, so Adam and Eve, we are told, had a choice between two trees. The tree of life or the tree of knowledge. In their case, they chose of the tree of knowledge rather than the tree of life. Who ultimately takes on the tree of life? Which is celebrated. Who takes on the tree of life? Good Anglicans are all nervous, Stephen. We're grilling. Who takes on the tree of life? Jesus. I like, he's so good here. He's like, Jesus. You know, just scared that maybe, maybe if I'm wrong, he won't hear it. Jesus. <laughs> so Jesus has the tree of life behind him because it is Jesus who ultimately embraces the tree of life. And because he does, Jesus is able to invite us to share in the divine life of God. Behind the Holy Spirit, you have a bit of a rock or a mountain that's turning towards. This isn't said something else in Christian spirituality. Spiritual life is often compared to that of a hiking or climbing up a mountain. That it's a very difficult journey, it's not an easy journey, but eventually over time it's ascent to God. And it's often believed that in our spiritual life it is the Holy Spirit who guides and leads us into all things. Finally, in the center, you have a bit of an altar. And on that altar, you have a chalice, presumably with wine. And you also see, well, you can't probably see real well here, also a figure of a lamb coming out of the chalice. And this scene would be portraying the Holy Eucharist. That it is in the Holy Eucharist that we encounter the Trinity at its most intimate level. This altar, this place where we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, is the space where we come to encounter the divine. But you'll notice two things. Jesus first has his fingers pointing to it, and the Spirit is leading us to it. Down at the very core of the altar, you have what is believed to be the relics. So traditionally in Christian altars, you would put a relic of a Christian martyr into the altar. And what Rublev is saying is that we here ought to offer ourselves as martyrs, as gifts to God, to place ourselves into the altar as well. A final detail, and then I'll give some 
little explanation here. The best detail in this icon is this. There's room for you. Notice how the three sit. The three sit not closed in on each other. They don't remain focused on each other. And this is the best part. This is the part you really have to pay attention to. Rather, the three sit in such a way as to invite you and me. It's an invitation. The Trinity is inviting us to come and sit and be as guests. Guests at the banquet. Now you might think, that's all great, and there will be a quiz afterwards, and we'll see how well you remembered everything I told you. But this is where the scene becomes most brilliant. If we say we are created in the image and likeness of God, then we too are to reflect the divine life of God in our own lives. And Rublev is pointing us to that by having the house behind the Father to remind us that you and I are to always extend a generous and lavish hospitality to all. In the church, as I said last Sunday, no one is excluded. No one. Now this is point two. If anybody tells you they know what God is talking about, run away. And if they tell you that God excludes anybody, run away. Because in God's house, no one is rejected. No one. And I will be clear about that. This church, no one will be rejected. All are welcome. And this is at the heart of the Judeo-Christian faith. We always are called to offer a generous, lavish hospitality. For that's what God does God's self. God constantly offers to you and I a welcome. And God also prepares a table for us to feast at. The table of life. To join at that banquet. The Trinity also invites us to enter into a loving relationship with one another. Faith is not an individual experience. Let me make that clear. The Christian life of faith isn't about me and Jesus. The Christian way of life is all about me entering, entering into relationship with others. Because that's what the Trinity is doing. If you look at the scene, there's a circular motion that's going on where each person of the Trinity is outpouring each of themselves, giving of themselves to others. You and I are called to give of ourselves as well as gift. To generously, lavishly, just give everything we have to love everyone fully as the Holy Trinity loves us. Ultimately, we're called to be the ones to sit at the banquet, to share in the Feast of Life. I invite you, and hopefully that gives you some sense here, <laughs> I invite you over the coming weeks, those of you that have this image, to sit before it for a while and to see what is this image inviting you in your life. What might be holding you back from entering into a loving, self-giving relationship with others? What fears, what anxieties? Come to the table. Place them there. Let the Trinity transform. Learn from the school of the Trinity, the school of love, the way of love. Put yourself there. Do you find yourself scared? Are you afraid to be in the presence of God? Then ask why. What is it about you that may prevent you from sitting at the feast? Maybe it's something in the past. Maybe it's something you feel of yourself. But allow yourself to come and sit at the feast with the divine life of God. If we believe the Trinity is always giving of itself to us out of love, then you and I are to give of ourselves out of love to each other. Let me end in this point. One of the reasons why I think the church struggles these days is because we forgot the way of love. 
I think we've become so consumed with maintaining our structures, our rules, our regulations, that we've forgotten ultimately what we are about. The God you and I profess to believe in, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a God who loves immensely and for whom nothing prevents us from entering that love. And if we truly wish for the church to thrive, for, for the church to grow, then we must confront our own prejudices. We must confront our own sinfulness that prevents us from loving one another fully and completely. And we must have some sense of humility. To not try to be here to guard what we feel is safe and sure, those little traditions that every church has that, you know, the priest always sits there and I always sit here, my bench is this spot. No, no, no. That we open ourselves to the working of God among us. And to welcome, to love, and to let all know that they belong here at the feast. Because that's what the Trinity is doing. The Trinity is inviting you and I to be at the feast. So let's offer a lavish feast. All are welcome here. Amen.